Hello, everybody. And today's lecture is going to focus on Dar al-Islam from Unit 1, Topic 2 of AP World History. Before we go much further, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in detail, Dar al-Islam refers to the home of Islam or the house of Islam. It's a reference to the variety of countries that, though they are diverse in terms of ethnicity, languages, culture, they share one commonality, which is that Islam dominates um, a lot of the culture and it dominates a lot of the government. So think of this as the, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, I apologize. Uh, think of this as the um, Islamic states that exist throughout Afro Eurasia. And even though they're diverse, they have a great deal um, in common through the religion of Islam. Now, before we get into this, we're going to need to kind of go to a background lecture. And what we're going to focus on is from 610 CE to about 1000 CE, getting us up to what we want to kind of pick up with Dar al-Islam in the curriculum. But we start with the beginnings of the religion of Islam. Just to make sure you understand, Islam is the religion. The Muslim is one who practices Islam. So it's important that you know the difference between those two words, if you don't already. And 610 CE is a significant year within Islam because it's the year that Muhammad, uh, a merchant from the city of Mecca, has a revelation. And he, he is visited by um, the angel Gabriel who reveals to Muhammad that he is the last and greatest prophet of Allah or of God. So Muhammad begins from 610 CE uh, till his death, 632 CE, proclaiming the message of Allah and the, I, um, the, the revelation of Allah through Muhammad. And Muhammad is seen as this great prophet of, of Allah. Now, Muhammad is connected also to Zoroastrianist communities, Judaism, and Christianity. What you have to understand is that in Muhammad's world, these three religions were well-known, well-established, and they certainly influenced um, society at this time. And the key feature of these three religions was the belief in a single God. And this monotheistic um, tradition certainly influences Islam. And there's other influences that these three religions seem to have on the development of Islam. We see a lot of commonalities between the four religions. And as a side note, I just want to touch on Zoroastrianism really briefly. Uh, Zoroastrianism pops up at around the 6th century uh, BCE. So by this point, it's been about 1,200 years that the religion has been around. And the prophet or the founder of Zoroastrianism proclaimed that there was one God and that he, this God was the righteous God. And that this God was opposed by an evil entity, and the good and the evil were in conflict, and that people should take the side of the good and be the righteous warriors for the righteous God. And if they are proper warriors and they live the good life, then there's a salvation that awaits them afterwards. And so you can see just from that little tidbit, the influences that this religion would certainly have on Christianity, the belief in a God and a devil, um, the belief that there's a salvation for his believers, and also um, the idea of Islam, because even Islam, Christianity, and Zoroastrianism all have days of reckoning, final moments where people will be judged, and the righteous shall be saved, and the, the, the wicked will be cast down. There will be a, a punishment and reward at the end of time. So these religions all kind of pop up from the Middle East, and they have interaction between them. Islam, of course, is unique by virtue of Muhammad's role and what Muhammad reveals um, from Allah. And what that revelation becomes known as is the Quran, which is the holy literature of Islam. Now, what happens after Muhammad begins to gain followers and gains political power? first in the city of Medina, and then in the city of Mecca, which is what is really the center of Islam still today, is he gains not just religious 
um, leadership, but he also gains political leadership. And he begins to build a kingdom. And Islam, under Muhammad's reign, will start to spread not just to Medina and Mecca, but all throughout the Arabian Peninsula. So Islam begins to undergo this, this spread, starting to bring in more people because of the political power of these Islamic city-states of Mecca and Medina. Now, I should note on the side, you'll see Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And we often refer to these three religions as the religions of Abraham. And Abraham is mostly known um, to these three religions. For Judaism, Abraham is the father to Isaac. And Isaac goes on to, Abraham is basically told that he has the blessings of God. And this God in Judaism is called Yahweh. And Christianity is referred to as Jehovah. And Islam is referred to as Allah. So you have this idea that within Judaism, the blessings of, of, in this case, Yahweh, goes to Abraham and his descendants through his son Isaac. And these would be the chosen people. Within Christianity, they recognize that the blessings of Yahweh or later Jehovah goes through Isaac and goes to all the people. But then there's this belief that Jesus is sent by God to atone for the sins of man and to save man. And that begins the process of bringing people into the Christian faith and the numbers begin to grow. And as Christianity makes its way into the European world, it starts to find new converts and the European culture kind of blends in with the Christian, um, the early Christian movement. And in the Christian case, Jesus is seen as a divine figure. And that's a key point about Christianity. Jesus is viewed as divine. For Islam, if you know anything about um, the Judeo-Christian tradition, Abraham was father also to a boy named Ishmael. So you have Abraham, father to Ishmael, and father to Isaac. In Judaism and Christianity, Abraham's legacy, Abraham's heir, is Isaac. But within Islam, Abraham's heir is Ishmael. And so the blessings that God gives to Abraham passes on through Ishmael and his descendants. So this becomes a justification for um, Islam being the true revelation of, of God. Muhammad is seen as the last and greatest prophet in a series of prophets who have come to proclaim to the world that all must submit to the will of Allah. And there's a couple key points that I want to bring up with Islam. One is this concept that Islam means to submit, to submit to the will of Allah. So Muhammad's message was that everyone should submit to the will of Allah. But the second thing is that Muhammad is seen as the latest and the last prophet of Allah. To Muslims, Jesus was a prophet. To Muslims, Abraham was a prophet. To Muslims, Moses was a prophet. So we do see this connection between these three faiths. So that's your basic background. You want to have this idea that in the Arabian Peninsula, there's a religion that begins called Islam. And what Islam starts to do is bring about political unity, political stability throughout the Arabian Peninsula. And when Muhammad dies, we have a series of states that follow. And I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. You don't need to like obsess about these details, but these are words you're going to want to know. So when Muhammad dies, the last and greatest prophet is dead. There's going to be no more prophets after him, yet Islam needs a leader. And that's what brings us to the creation or the emergence of the caliphates, which we're going to put from 632 CE to 1258 CE. So there's a series of caliphates, and all a caliphate is, is a, a region run by a caliph. So if we look at the definitions part of this outline, the caliph is the successor to Muhammad. It's the individual who takes on the religious and political leadership of the Islamic state or the Islamic world. And a caliphate is just the kingdom or the territory ruled by a caliph. So caliphate, you could put in the word kingdom, um, caliph, is the leader. 
So we start first with the Rashidun Caliphates. So from 632 to 661, if you take a look at the map on your right, the red that's in the Arabian Peninsula with Medina and Mecca, that is Muhammad's um, political territory. And then you have this spread into the orange, and you can see how rapidly Islam spreads throughout the region. This is your Rashidun Caliphate. Russia, the Rashidun Caliphate expansion comes at the expense of surrounding empires. One of these empires, you can see it across the, um, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, is called the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire is going to lose land to the spread of Islam. But also, in, on the map, if you look where it says Iran and Iraq, that's where the Sassanian Empire was. And the Sassanian Empire is the new Persian Empire. So again, we're going back a little bit further in history. And if you look where it says Iran, and if you look where it says Iraq, there has always been, since about 600 BCE, uh, an empire that we will just refer to as the Persian Empire. There's actually many different names, but what they have in common is that they're all Persian empires. The Persian Empire is some of the first empires in this particular region. They have bureaucracies, they build roads, they maintain um, control over diverse populations, all the things that empires do. So as Islam expands, it expands into the newest um, creation of the Persian world, which is the Sassanian Empires. And as you can see, it basically does away with the Sassanian Empire. This spread, if you look at the red and you look at the orange, is accomplished through military means. The armies under the caliphate undergo military campaigns to spread Islam throughout that territory. Now, we'll talk about the pink momentarily. By the way, if you hear a bunch of screaming, that's my children just getting ready for bed. So in 661 CE, the Rashidun Caliphate falls into civil war. There's an argument about who the proper successor should be. One group favors a family who will become the Umayyad dynasty. And another group favors a, a leader named Ali, who is a descendant of Muhammad. So the idea is that this, this debate over who the next ruler or the next caliph should be sparks a civil war. And in 661 CE, Ali is the, the champion of the Shi'i side of the split is going to be assassinated. And this creates a division between the two groups. The Sunni are going to go on to become the majority of Muslims, but the Shi'i are going to create caliphates and create regions um, and create political power in different pockets throughout the, the history of this region. The Sunni-Shi'i split is a split that remains up to today. And it is a bitter rivalry. Instead of Shi'i, sometimes we'll call it Shi'ite. Um, but this split is going to be a deep political division within Islam. In the wake of this civil war comes the Umayyad dynasty, or the Umayyad caliphate. And they're going to start to develop their bureaucracy, their kingdom, from Damascus. So the school you know so well, they, they bring in Jimmy Cohn, they bring in uh, Chipotle. But if you take a look at the map, and you look at Syria down by the Mediterranean Sea, you'll see Damascus. This becomes the center of the Umayyad Caliphate. And what the Umayyad Caliphate does is they continue the military expansion. And it's very important to note, if you look at the pink going towards Afghanistan, they're starting to spread beyond the Persian Empire and starting to push into the uh, South Asian, Central Asian regions. But if you look at how they go west across North Africa, and they cross over into Spain. So what the Umayyad does is they, they spread Islam through military means to a, a pretty extensive point throughout the Islamic world. Now, the other thing to note about the Umayyad dynasty is that a tension starts to develop. Initially, Islam is created on the Ar Arabian Peninsula, and the ethnic group who dominates Islam is Arab. However, as the Islamic world starts to branch out, they start to run into different ethnic groups, and they start to incorporate non-Arab groups into their, their kingdom. 
under the Umayyad, those non-Arab groups are going to be treated as second-class citizens with limited freedoms, limited rights, and that's going to start to create a tension within the empire. And that tension is eventually going to upend the Umayyad dynasty. Which brings me to the next one. This is going to be our last part of the background, the Abbasid Caliphate. So around 740 to 750 CE, uh, a challenging dynasty to the Umayyad starts to emerge called the um, Abbasid. And the Abbasid are going to carry out a revolt against the Umayyad. They're going to base the revolt on two things. One, the idea that the Umayyad had betrayed the ideals of Islam and were becoming immoral and had, had lost the moral will to do things correctly. So the Abbasids saw themselves as restoring this world to a proper Muslim faith. So that moral argument, if you think of it this way, think back to East Asia when they talked about the mandate of heaven. And when the empire became corrupt, there was time for them to go. In a way, we have a similar thing here. The, the Umayyad are viewed as morally corrupt, and the Abbasids say, we're going to take it over, and we're going to establish a proper Muslim caliphate. And they also appealed to the non-Arabs, saying, in our caliphate, you will have rights, you will have greater freedoms, you will enjoy greater privilege within our society. So a lot of the non-Arabs who were irritated with the Umayyad support the Abbasid, and by 750 CE, the Abbasid have overthrown the Umayyad and creates a new caliphate. Now, this is where we start to see an expansion even further of Islamic influence. But instead of by military means, we're going to see it through different means. So the first thing we want to look at is the growth of Baghdad. Again, if you take a look at the map, you'll see Baghdad located to the east of Damascus. Baghdad becomes the new capital. Now, what's significant about Baghdad is that it's located in the Persian world. So even though the Arabs have taken over this region, what we call Persia, those Persian bureaucrats start to influence the political leadership of the Abbasid caliphates. Um, they start to build palaces that look very similar to Persian palaces. They start to dress like Persian emperors did in days gone past. And basically what happens is that the Islamic world starts to leave its um, Arabic roots behind and starts to embrace a more Persian world, a more Persian culture. The second thing is that during about 800 CE, trade starts to intensify, due in large part to the development of Islam. Islam starts to provide a political stability in this region and anytime there's political stability in history, economic trade will flourish. So in this case, trade routes that especially run through Baghdad allow for Muslim merchants to spread throughout the Afro-Eurasian world. And these Muslim merchants, along with missionaries, are going to go along these trade routes, whether they're the Silk Road or they're the Indian Ocean trade networks, and they're going to take along with them Islam. So you want to think of the spread of Islam throughout Afro-Eurasia in kind of two steps. You have the initial 600s, which is the military spread. And then as you get into the 800s, it's done by merchants. It's done by mercantilism or mercantile activity. That brings me to the letter C, the Sufi missionaries and the appeal of the Sufi missionaries. So like all religions, Islam has a great deal of diversity of thought. If you have a tough time understanding that, within Christianity, you have Catholics and you have Protestants. There's a variety of thought about the religion. No religion that I know of has just one thought that all believers buy into. There is usually diversity of thought, and Islam is no exception. On the one hand, you have your very conservative, traditional Islamic scholars. And that is not exactly appealing to the lower classes. It doesn't give people something to grab onto. What the Sufi missionaries do is they are able to bring Islam to the common person's level. The Sufi version of Islam is a mystical religion. It talks about having an intimate relationship with God in terms of a feeling versus just reading literature and reading books. 
But the other thing that the Sufi missionaries excel at is translating Islam to non-monotheistic cultures. So Christians and Jews who may have converted to Islam, that was a pretty easy conversion if they were to do it because they believed in one God. However, as Islam spreads into South Asia and Islam comes into contact with Hindus, for example, the polytheism or the um, henotheism of Hinduism is going to present a challenge to Islam. And the Sufi are able to bridge that gap between these two ways of thinking about the world. Um, the other thing is that the Sufi were very helpful to people who were in the lower classes of society. And that brings me to one thing that I just want to talk about in general. Christianity and Islam share another thing in common. They both seek out new converts. In order to get converts, you want to appeal to them and make your religion attractive. Christianity and Islam have the promise of salvation, just as Buddhism does. And for the lower classes who, who didn't have a lot to work with to begin with, this promise of salvation was extremely strong and pulled them into Islam and Christianity. Lastly, the House of Wisdom. The House of Wisdom is basically a, uh, a library, a building where scholars from across the world or the Afro-Eurasian world came together to exchange ideas and to learn from one, one another. So the House of Wisdom also is going to help spread the Islamic influence through intellectual endeavors and intellectual pursuits. And now we get to the decline of the Abbasid Caliphate, and we're going to talk more about that in the next slide. So about the 1100s to the 1200s, the um, Abbasid Caliphate begins to fall. Part of it is invasion from outside groups, which we'll talk about momentarily. And the other part is that as trade routes begin to move more north, and less trade is coming through Baghdad and the central parts of the Abbasid dynasty, they lose money and they lose influence. So you have an economic development, the changing of trade routes, but you also have a military development, which is the invasion of outside groups. So let's talk a little bit about that political defragmentation. I'm gonna do this in two parts. So the first thing is kind of a timeline to show you the five different groups that are going to come in and start to remake this Abbasid world or this Islamic world. One group is called the Seljuk Turks. The Seljuk Turks are an important group in the sense that they take over this Islamic world because they are Islam, but they are a different ethnicity, a different culture. They're Turkish. And the Turkish culture comes from the Central Asian region. They're nomadic. They are strong warriors. They are horseback um, armies. And they begin this process of taking more and more land and establishing a central government. They also establish what's called a sultan. So you can think of the movie Aladdin. The sultan becomes the political leader of the Seljuk Turk Empire. And the religious leader, the caliph, who used to be the political leader, is reduced. So now you've got a situation where the sultan, the leader of the Turks, takes the political power of the region, and the caliph is reduced to a religious leadership. So in a way, the whole concept of the caliph is starting to come to an end. Then you get the Crusades, which we'll talk more about when we get to Europe. In the case of the Crusades, for a long time, the Abbasid dynasty allowed Christian missionaries to come into places like Jerusalem uh, with relative ease. When the Seljuk Turks take over that region in the Middle East, they start to cut off the pilgrimage routes for Western Christians and Eastern Christians. This provokes a backlash from Europe, which particularly Western Europe, which we call the Crusades. Crusades started about 1095 CE, 1097. And they're going to run through to about 1,200. So that's why I just put down the 1,100s. What happens is that as the Crusaders come in, they start to establish Christian kingdoms, or what we call the Crusader kingdoms, or the Latin kingdoms, in the Middle East. For example, Jerusalem is going to be run by Western Europeans, by the Latin world. 
And what we get with these crusades is an interaction between the Islamic world and the European world. Now for letter C, we get the Egyptian Mamluks. So a Mamluk is a, a Mamluk, it refers to a slave that was held in the service of the Abbasid and they, they worked in the bureaucracy. They became military leaders, political leaders, but they were still considered slaves. In about the 1200s, the Mamluks in Egypt undertake a revolution where they establish their own kingdom, a regional kingdom is established. And it's gonna stick around until about the 1500s. So there's another point where Egypt is starting to break away from the Abbasid dynasty and establish itself as its own state. In the 1200s, you can also see the Delhi Sultanate. That is gonna establish itself throughout South Asia um, and become its own state. And the leaders of the Delhi Sultanate are descendants of Turks. The Mamluks are descendants of Turks. The Seljuks are descendants of Turks. So what we're seeing is a non-Arab group, the Turks, coming in and establishing a new political order in what was Dar al-Islam. And then in the later 1200s, you get the Mongols. And basically, we can end most of everything in Afro Eurasia with the Mongols invaded. And we'll talk more about the Mongols later. So what I want to do is I want to talk quickly about this world history map. And I'm going to kind of jump around in the map to kind of show you what you should be seeing. So I'm going to back this up. I'm going to assume you can hear that music pretty well. And I'm gonna take it back to the period of time that we've been talking about. And it is my favorite plan book place. I love this place. I, I can skip the ad, that's even better. So let's move this up to 853. And what this does a great job of doing is showing you the political changes that are taking place. So I'm gonna kind of talk. If you take a look right here, you see, first of all, you see the Sassanin and the, the Byzantine Empire. There's your spread of Islam in the green. And that's your Rashidun Caliphate. And pretty soon that's gonna transform over to the Umayyad. Now watch how the Umayyad spread across North Africa, the Byzantines beat it back, and then the Umayyad take it right back over. And now watch right here, the spread into Spain. So this green shows a strongly established Islamic state called the Umayyad. There's some changes. And now you get to your Abbasid. So you saw that quick little change. Now the Abbasid is gonna provide a stability. And this is where Islam's influence is no longer going by the military, but rather by merchants coming into this region and coming into this region in Southeast Asia, which we'll talk about as the next topic. Now, pretty soon, the music tells you something big is gonna happen. You will see this area start to diminish as other groups start to come in and take it over. The Safavid dynasty is a Turkish empire uh, that's gonna take over what is Persia. And I want you to watch in this region, which is where the Turks are. And pretty soon you're gonna see the Seljuk Turks emerge. I promise you any minute now. It's exciting music. It is can't get enough of this. Here come the Seljuk Turks. I'm off by a few decades. Oh. You can see, oh, there's the Seljuks. Now watch them expand through what was the Abbasid Empire and start to expand even more into the Abbasid Empire. Now you have this Turkish state dominated coming into what is today Turkey. And if you watch here, you can kind of see how the Seljuks break up. If you see this mustard yellow, those are the crusader states. And now you can see the Abbasid trying to work their way back. Um, we're gonna let this run a little bit more. You should start to see right here, there's another sultanate in what is Egypt. And that eventually is gonna have a rebellion by the Mamluks and is gonna establish a Mamluk kingdom. I want you to keep an eye also on these people. There's your Delhi Sultanate. Watch how the Mongols start to come in and start to dominate through what was the Abbasid Empire. And we will stop it right there at 1258.
And you can see how the Mamluk Sultanate is basically based out of Egypt. That is going to continue itself. But the Mongol Empire has run across and dominated throughout what used to be the Islamic world. So if I get myself out of this YouTube presentation and take you guys back to the PowerPoint, um, you get a strong sense of how the Abbasid dynasty falls apart and how this world is turned on its head after centuries of stability and of political uni unity. So the next thing is Dar al-Islam. So again, Dar al-Islam refers to the House of Islam. That's its definition. It's the idea that a variety of states throughout Afro-Eurasia is united together by their common practices of Islam and the common role that Islam plays in the political structure. And yet, this is an extremely diverse region. Here are the important things to recognize about Dar al-Islam. First, there's intellectual continuities. So Muslim scholars are going to continue past traditions in this world. One of them is ancient Greek philosophy. The works of Aristotle, the works of Plato, are translated and um, analyzed by Muslim scholars and commented upon. There's a great deal of, of emphasis on Greek philosophy throughout this world of Dar al-Islam. The other thing is that the Greek philosophy is well known for its use of observation of nature and rationalism and logic. In other words, the ancient Greeks, while they had their mythologies and they had their superstitions, also relied on observation of the natural world to understand how the natural world worked. We call this rationalism. And this rationalism is going to become very important to the Islamic world. And they're going to incorporate that into their scientific understandings and pursuits. But coming out of India are mathematics. Um, what happens is that Muslim scholars are going to take Indian mathematics and improve upon them. The word algebra has its roots within Arabic. And algebra is what the Muslims produce based off of Indian mathematical principles. The other thing, and also off of Greek principles too, but the other thing is that when we look at our standard numbers, if you look at the number one, two, three, four, we call these Arabian numerals. These Arabian numerals are based off of Indian numerals. And then the third thing that the Islamic world does is they adopt Chinese paper making technology. If you remember one of the technological innovations of China, not just with the Song Dynasty, but before the Song Dynasty, was the making of paper. And the Islamic world is going to incorporate the making of paper, and that's going to help grow the intellectual foundations of, of Dar al-Islam. But here's the key. This is going to be an important transfer to Europe. When, when Europeans in the Renaissance read on the Greek philosophers, they're probably reading Arabic translations that they're translating into Latin. The, the scientific revolution is based off of this understanding of mathematics and science that makes its way through the Islamic world. And I want you to underline that word transfer because this is a critical part of Dar al-Islam. Their intellectual pursuits are going to help transfer over to Europe and it's going to spark European development, such as the scientific revolution and the Renaissance later. The other thing is, is that while there were continuities, there are also innovations. So within the world of math, we have Nasir Adin al tusi And what he does is he takes mathematics. He's, he's an example of somebody who takes the mathematical principles and elaborates and expands upon them. He's particularly influential in the development of algebra as we know it today. Medical advances. I can't emphasize this particular thing enough. The Muslim world starts to make advances in medical technologies and medical understandings. They are well ahead of the curve. They understand, not at our level, but they understand how diseases are transmitted. They have what's called a theory of contagion where they say that a disease is spread not because God is angry, but because there's something in the air that people are breathing in. Now, they may not understand it at the level we've come to understand it, but they understand that something scientific and 
explicable is going on, not something related to superstition. And if you look over on the right at the picture, you can see kind of an early pharmacy. In those pots are a variety of herbs that can be crushed up and made into medicine. In fact, the King of England, Richard the Lionheart, who was a key player in the Crusades, said that he would only have Muslim doctors tend to him. So Muslim doctors were renowned for their knowledge and their skill. And then lastly, with the literature, um, Ashi, Ashai al Baniya is a, uh, uh, an author who is going to write a great deal about the religion of Islam, about Sufi mysticism. And what makes it unique is that her publications is done by a woman. Now, within the Islamic world, women were allowed to study and they were allowed to write and publish. She is the most extensive author of works at this time. So it does show you a little bit that females or women in the Islamic world did have greater freedom of movement and greater opportunities than women in Europe and women in China would have at the, that particular time. Moving on to the last, no, second to last slide. Continuing on, the role of merchants. Again, I want to emphasize this idea that merchants were critical to the spread of Islam, starting after about 800 all the way through to about 12, 1300. Islam is going to spread throughout Southeast Asia, throughout India. And it's also going to go into West Africa by virtue of merchant activity and the idea of cultural diffusion. So merchants were held in high esteem within the Islamic world. You remember in China, merchants were considered the lowest of the low. However, in the Middle East, Muhammad was a merchant himself. The role of the merchant holds high esteem and high status within the Islamic world, which encourages Islam to spread out amongst those trade routes. So you've got this perfect storm, if you will. You've got a religion that seeks out converts. You've got um, trade starting to grow and trade routes like the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean connecting different cultures today together. And we see this rapid spread of Islam through after 800 because of that trade. And that leads to cultural diffusion. The ideas of the Islamic world spreads throughout this region. And the ideas of these different regions come to the Islamic world. But what holds them together is the common practices of Islam. Lastly, we get diasporic communities. I want to plant this into your head right now. The idea is that Muslim merchants are going to set themselves up close to where they're doing business. So Muslim merchants are going to set themselves up in China. We're going to start seeing Muslim communities form. And this is what we refer to as a diasporic community. A diasporic community is when a, an outside group kind of moves into a new area and yet they maintain their cultural identity and they maintain cultural practices. Then there is this thing that we talked about with East Asia as well. How do they deal with diversity? Because as this Islamic world grows and the Dar al-Islam model starts to take shape, there's going to be a variety of peoples and a variety of religions. One of the ways was this concept called people of the book. To Muslims, Christians and Jews and Zoroastrianists worship one God. They're monotheistic. So in the eyes of Muslims, especially under the Umayyad and the Abbasid, Christians and Jews would have been seen, and Zoroastrianists, would have been seen as people of the book. And they would have been allowed to practice their religion without a lot of interference, provided that they paid a special tax to the government. And that special tax is what we call the jizah. And the jizah is a special tax levied on non-Muslims to show submission to the state. When we go to Spain, we see this diversity issue come up in spades. And if you look at the case of Spain, Spain we have what's called Al-Andalus, which basically refers to this community of Christians, Jews, and, and Muslims. And Al-Andalus is basically just the Iberian Peninsula, or what is today Spain and Portugal. So it's a reference to the peninsula itself. But if you take a look over at the right at the map, you'll see this caliphate of Cordoba. 
And the Caliphate of Cordoba creates this political unity that allows for the increase of trade and allows for the increase of intellectual practices. And what it does is it connects this part of the world to the Indian and Chinese culture. Trade starts to come up to this Iberian Peninsula. Chinese Indian goods start to make their way up to this part of Spain. And you start to see this connection between Western Europe and the Chinese and Indian worlds. If you remember in the last lecture, I talked about this concept of a southernization of history. And here we have an example of how Islam is transferring knowledge from the Indian Ocean and from China to Western Europe. That will be the basis for developments to come. The last thing I want to mention is the rights of women. Basically, Islamic women or Muslim women, when we typically think of women in Islam, we think of the hijab. We think of the, the, um, the veil and how women are, in some cultures, forced to cover their whole face, and other cultures, just their area around the face. The hijab actually dates back to ancient Syria. It goes back thousands of years. This was a cultural practice in, in the Middle East well before Islam comes along. So that cultural practice will stay put, and what Islam will do is incorporate it especially throughout the Arab world. And the idea is that a woman should preserve her beauty only for her husband or her future husband. So to go out in public and reveal her beauty would have been seen as an affront to, to her husband. Likewise, Muhammad advised men to wear loose clothing in public um, to, to cover their heads, also as a sign of humility and also the idea that they reserve their physical beauty for their wives. In other words, we shouldn't go out flouting our beauty to other people, you know, in public when we should be more discreet and more, um, you know, more conservative. So when we think of the hijab, we think of a suppression of women. But in fact, women were allowed to study. They were allowed to learn how to read. In some cases, they were allowed to do divorce and initiate divorce. Muhammad said that a woman, that a dowry um, should be paid to the woman, not to her father. That if a woman was divorced, she was entitled to property from her husband. There were several rights that were preserved for women that you don't necessarily see in China and Europe at this time. So to wrap things up, what I want to point out about Dar al-Islam is this concept of continuity, innovation, and diversity. And this was a theme that we focused on with East Asia. In terms of continuity, this Islamic world is going to continue the ancient knowledge from the Greeks and the Indians. Um, this is going to be an important contribution to West European developments later. The merchant culture of the Middle East predates Islam and is going to maintain itself throughout this, this period of what we call Dar al-Islam and the importance placed on trade. So the idea is that this ancient knowledge that the Islamic world is renowned for has its roots in the past, and that's the, 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 the part of continuity. And then we have this merchant community, this merchant culture that incorporates itself into the Muslim world, and that's a continuity of the pre-Muslim world. But then you also have innovation. The, the, the innovation within medicine, for example, the innovation within literature and art, they all show that this culture is also developing new things. We can also see this innovation in farming technology and farming in general, the use of irrigation techniques, which allowed for greater productivity. And like I said, in East Asia, when you have greater productivity of food, you have a more stable society and a more stable population. And then the last thing is dealing with diversity. This is going to be a constant theme throughout this first thing. Dar al-Islam is an extremely diverse region. But the one thing that this region has in common is the religion of Islam. In order to understand Islam, you have to understand the Quran, the holy book of Islam. And in order to read the Quran, you have to speak Arabic. So here's this Islamic world that stretches from Spain and West Africa all the way to, to the northwest part of India. 
many different languages, many different ethnicities, but they share one thing in common. They can all speak Arabic. They all prescribe to the idea that the Quran is the basis of truth. They practice similar religious, um, I apologize if I just hit the mic really hard. Um, they all practice similar religious traditions, such as praying five times a day in the direction of Mecca, making a pilgrimage to Mecca, fasting during the holy month of Ramadan, paying alms to the poor, and lastly, proclaiming that Muhammad is the last and greatest prophet that Allah should be submitted to. Those five things that I just mentioned, and feel free to rewind and look them over in the video, those are the five pillars of faith. And whether you're a Muslim in West Africa or you're a Muslim in present-day Pakistan, you practice those five pillars of faith. That creates a unity within this diverse region. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, Estar al-Islam. The next lecture will be topic 1.3, which will focus on South and Southeast Asia. So in the meantime, please make note of your questions, and I look forward to our next lecture together. Take care.